Welcome back to Bad Things in History. I'm your friendly neighborhood narrator Harvey, an actual person, despite my computer-generated face and the vaguely AI-sounding way I talk. I'll dive into this week's topic in a matter of seconds, but I just wanted to say hi. So, hi. For most of recorded history, men have held the power of life and death over entire societies. They are usually responsible for making the most important decisions, and this is done while ignoring or actively excluding women from the process. It isn't surprising to learn that most acts of cruelty are also perpetrated by men. But not all women in the past were powerless, and sometimes they could be just as violent and vicious as their male counterparts. Today we are going to tell you about Delphine Lalori, who became known for torturing and killing slaves. The Beginning Delphine Lalori was born as Marie Delphine McCarty on March 19, 1787. She was born in New Orleans, which was owned by the Spanish at that time. Delphine's father brought the family to New Orleans from Ireland in 1730. Both of her parents were prominent members in the local community. They were well-known and generally very wealthy. When the family first arrived, New Orleans was a French territory. It became a Spanish territory in the 1760s after France suffered a loss in the Seven Years' War. Delphine married at the age of 13 to a high-ranking Spanish officer named Don Ramon de Lopez y Anjulo, but they wouldn't remain citizens of the Spanish Empire for long. In 1803, New Orleans became a United States territory. Don Ramon was assigned to represent the U.S. in Madrid in 1804. He died while in transit. Delphine gave birth to their daughter a few days later. She remarried in 1808 to a prominent banker and lawyer named Jean Blanc. Jean was almost as wealthy as Delphine's family. They had four children together, but Delphine's second husband passed away in 1816. She married her third and final husband in 1825. He was a physician named Leonard Louis Nicolas Lalori, who was much younger than her. Their marriage was not a happy one, but it endured for several years. In 1831, they bought property in New Orleans at 1140 Royal Street. The family resided there, as did their slaves. Slavery was a common and unfortunate feature of life in New Orleans, but in the late 1700s and early 1800s, slaves in the Caribbean and North America did not always accept their fate. Numerous rebellions broke out and some were successful. As a result, slave owners in New Orleans were extremely paranoid. Delphine's uncle was murdered in 1771 by one of his own slaves, the Haitian Revolution began in 1791, and those slaves were incredibly successful in freeing themselves from white oppression. They also brutally killed and tortured many of their former masters. But events closer to home were the most troubling for some in New Orleans. To fully understand the mindset of slave owners during this period, it helps to know more about what happened in 1811. 1811 New Orleans Revolt in early January, three slaves met to plan an armed revolt. They gathered in a cabin 30 miles north of New Orleans. While there, they tried to find a way to win their freedom and keep it. Charles de Santis was the son of a slave woman and a French plantation owner. Harry Kenner was a 25-year-old carpenter. Quamana was an African warrior who was kidnapped and brought to Louisiana. Together, they would lead the largest slave revolt in American history. The three men enlisted the help of more leaders. Together, they raised an army of 500 slaves willing to fight and die for their freedom. The slave army dressed in their own unique military uniforms. They kept chanting, On to New Orleans, as they marched toward the city. Their goal was to conquer the city, then kill its white inhabitants. After that, they would establish a free African Republic on the Mississippi River. First, they would have to fight the forces that were sent to stop their rebellion. In a nearby cane field, the slave army faced off against American military forces and a militia formed by plantation owners in the area. The former slaves did not run. 
They formed themselves into a line and continued firing for as long as they had ammunition. In the end, the ones who survived were overwhelmed. The plantation owners captured Charles de Sandes. First, they chopped off his hands. Then they beat him in the thighs until the bones were broken. Finally, they roasted his still barely living body on a pile of burning straw. More than 100 slaves were executed after the battle ended. Many were beheaded. The victims' heads were placed on poles all around the city. The gates of New Orleans held the dangling and mutilated corpses and were visible to anyone who entered or left the city. A traveler to New Orleans a few days after the revolt said, Their heads, which decorate our levee all the way up the coast, look like crows sitting on long poles. Delphine and the slave owners of her generation never forgot the events of the uprising, and they maintained a constant fear and paranoia about the slaves they owned. Unfortunately, it did not result in more humane treatment. The Mansion Fire Delphine freed two of her slaves. One was given freedom in 1819 and another in 1832. It was perhaps the only act of kindness she ever showed them. Delphine Lalori fed her slaves as little as possible. It was so cruel that her daughters would try to sneak extra food to them. Delphine found out, then beat her daughters for trying to interfere. In 1836, a 12-year-old slave girl named Leah was brushing Delphine's hair. She encountered a knot in Delphine's hair and tugged too hard. It angered Delphine and she grabbed a whip, intending to beat the child for this transgression. Leah decided she didn't want to live as a slave any longer. She also didn't want to suffer another beating. So the child jumped from a window and fell to her death on the street below. Authorities heard about this and arrived to find Delphine burying the dead girl. The city fined her $300 and forced her to sell nine slaves. Although slavery is never pleasant, New Orleans was actually more kind to the enslaved than other parts of the South. They had laws that required a certain level of humane treatment for slaves. Delphine went beyond what was acceptable, which is why she was punished. Enforcement of these laws was not always rigorous. Delphine sold her slaves as the law required. The nine slaves were next sold to a relative of Delphine's who then returned them to her. The authorities in New Orleans did not care. Her cruelty could no longer be ignored when the mansion caught on fire on April 10, 1834. Delphine kept her cook chained to the stove in the kitchen. And like the other slaves, she wasn't fed very well. She was also an old woman at 70 years old. Apparently, she did something wrong and feared being punished. Rather than face more pain and terror, the poor woman decided to die. The only way she could do that was by setting the kitchen on fire. Bystanders responded to the fire, wanting to make sure everybody was evacuated. When they asked for keys to the slave quarters, Delphine and the rest of her family refused to help. The group broke down the door and was disgusted at what they found. Seven slaves, more or less horribly mutilated, suspended by the neck, with their limbs apparently stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. But that wasn't all. Another man had a hole in his head that was filled with maggots. The men that were suspended by the neck were wearing iron collars with inward-facing spikes, which meant they couldn't move their heads at all or sleep. One of those who saw the state of the slaves was a local New Orleans judge. He asked Delphine's husband about it, and the reply was, Some people had better stay at home rather than come to others' houses to dictate laws and meddle with other people's business. When news of the tortured slaves became public knowledge, an angry mob appeared at the mansion. They entered the building, taking everything of value. Then it was set on fire. Delphine's legacy of torture and cruelty was finished. The legend continues. When the mansion caught fire, Delphine and her family fled New Orleans. They traveled over land to reach Mobile, Alabama. Next, the group boarded a ship which took them to Paris. The mob did not kill the slaves that were found in Delphine's mansion. 
but they didn't have a pleasant fate either. They were all taken to a local jail and put on display so the public would know of Delphine's cruelty. The final fate of Delphine LaLaurie is uncertain. A letter written by her son in 1842 said she wanted to finally return to New Orleans, but the disapproval of her children convinced Delphine it wasn't a good idea. Archives in Paris record that she died at the age of 62 in 1849, but a plate in a New Orleans cemetery claims Delphine died in Paris in 1842. Nobody knows for sure what killed her. There was at least one claim that she died in a boar hunting accident. For the most part, after she left New Orleans, Delphine LaLaurie disappeared from history. But the stories of her cruelty live on. The most disturbing part of Delphine's story is that the way she treated her slaves wasn't considered cruel in most parts of the South. She was never in any legal jeopardy for her actions. If not for an angry mob, the torture would have continued for another decade. What do you think about Delphine? Is it okay she probably lived her last years in Paris? Or would it have been better if the angry mob had their way? If you learned something interesting from this episode, then please hit the like button and subscribe if you want to see more in the future. We could have meaningful and fulfilling lives, but instead we're doing this, so your approval is all we have left. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.